never gets better than it gets right now. I never gets better than it quits. I never gets better than it gets right now. I never gets better than it quits. I never gets better than it gets right now. Good evening. Welcome to Tweet Up, where we take video games, music, movies, and books way too <laughs> seriously. I'm Neil. This is Zach. And today we're going to talk about Black Sun Rising, Woo! the 1991 science fantasy novel by Celia S. Friedman. Uh, first thing, I'm just going to do it. Call it out. <laughs> Uh, Michael Whalen, cover art. Uh, he's a rock star. Yes, um, he really is. I love the cover art. Um, did the cover art also for Way of Kings yeah. and many, many the things. Stormlight Archive for Anna Sanderson, yep. He also and... did the cover art for Sepultura, Chaos AD, and like Beneath the Remains and Arise, and uh, recently did the new cover for the new Smolder album. He's done a bunch of metal Meat stuff. Meatloaf, Bad yeah. Out of Hell Part yeah, 2, man. Meatloaf. So Michael, Michael Whalen. Whalen. He's, He's amazing. Awesome, dude. Um, he also have done like other Celia S. Friedman novels. You got there, This Alien Shore, uh, The Madness Season. So Celia has generally written science fiction, mm -hmm. and this is Black Sun Rising that we're talking about today is science fantasy. Yeah, I mean it's science fiction, but it. I mean it's fiction for sure. <laughs> but I mean, it definitely leans into fantasy. It does. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so, yeah uh, this book was written in 1991. I read it uh, around that age. Uh, or that yeah, time. you read it before me. You yeah. introduced me to it. I think you it. borrowed this copy. Probably in like I don't know what 2099, something like that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Somewhere in there. Uh, and I'm glad that you liked it. And we both read the full yeah. trilogy. Uh, this is book one of a trilogy. Um, uh, jump right into the setting. So uh, it's set on a planet called Erna. Erna is an Earth colony uh, settled by humans. Uh, seems like an ideal place to live. Uh, really uh, uh, person-friendly climate. Uh, some pretty severe earthquakes. Some really bad seismic activity. But at first glance, man, it seems like a great spot. And they land. Uh, and this book actually takes place 1,200 years after the the initial landing on Erna, uh, E R N A, uh, what they don't know as they are uh, landing and settling on this planet, and some strange things start to happen, is that Erna has a natural phenomenon uh, that is called Fey. Uh, you might call it magic, um, but it's not magic. It's, it's just part of the planet. It's part of the planet. The concept is one of the strongest things about this book and this book has some amazing characters. So uh, Yeah, it's and really it has good. some really cool concepts and like yeah, You want to talk about Faye a little bit? Like Well, yeah, and like so the reason so the Faye uh it reacts to human thoughts. Yeah, and, and emotions. And emotions. And so like for example, this is you said it's 1200 years 1200 or years yeah. so this is at 1200 years after humans arrived on here and they don't the reason it's like science fantasy is because they don't really use technology anymore because it doesn't work because it's so cool like it's unreliable because if if someone who's using a machine doesn't it has doubts about whether or doesn't not the machine how it works, will work thinks about how it could break down then the machine will not work because yeah. the world reacts to human thought patterns you yeah. know it's really a pretty interesting yeah. idea and it also human thought patterns influence the evolution of like the creatures yeah on the planet you know yeah um, uh there's a, a character in the book who's working on the uh evolving a natural species into cats uh, and he's able to do so within a handful of generations, unlike, you know, the, and he's turning them into, like, Earth-like cats by thinking about it yeah. and focusing on it. For, I mean, trees, whole parts of the environment, and yeah. other beings. Imagine, if you will, if human beings could, as a result of thinking, watching Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, the Andy Serkis movies, and you think about how apes could evolve and you get scared about it. Well, hey, guess what's going to start happening? Yeah. Apes are going to start evolving and being really smart if you're on Earth. So things didn't go very well with like the the people the, the first yeah settlers they had some on problems Erna. and yeah. and even be, yeah uh, any child that has a nightmare is probably going to create in real life 
their their nightmare yeah. and or adult yeah uh, yeah a, a human being at one point they say a human being throughout their lifetime can create thousands of these you know beings yeah. uh manifestations of the fae which can physically harm and end human beings lives yeah um so yeah, not a really friendly environment to grow uh, to be in to humans. After all, Neil said there's no tech, and they're at about a mid, mm, renaissance level of technology. Yeah, well, there's. A, I love this part. Like, there's a part when uh, they're crossing the Serpent River, right? Yeah. And like this boat that they're on does have a motor, and like the 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 captain or whatever the ship like opens the compartment to like look at the motor to like just i believe in you yeah. i believe Reinforcing. that you can i know work. how you work yeah. and i know and you're going to do a great job and they, go, they go about their business so yeah. it's like and like some some of the so we're going to try and be spoiler yeah, free we do want to avoid spoilers here i know it's a 31 year old book but it's super we're trying good. to encourage you to yeah. read it so we don't want to spoil it but yeah. some characters can use like firearms and stuff yes. if they have confidence in their you know, yeah. capabilities. I know yeah. that this will work because I do it all the time and this will, yeah. yeah but exactly. others cannot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Um, um, it's an amazing, the world building in this is really great. Uh, yeah. I feel like, um, I feel like science fantasy is pretty common now. I feel actually now. like any, you know, it used to be that magic in fantasy novels was just, you know, I am a servant of the secret fire. Kind of thing. You know what I mean? So I have magic. Um, but like, I feel like most, even like things are sort of, changing to systems. Yeah. Even you know? most straight fantasy has like explanations for how the magic Order works. And, chaos and it's just and not from acid. like, it's not like, even like D and D forever was just like, you're channeling <laughs> the power of a God. You right. have to pick a God right. and that's how you're casting spells. Yeah. I mean, even I guess Elden Ring does that to a certain extent, mm. but I feel like a lot of modern fantasy mm. does go into this, what we call science fantasy, where there are more like sort of explanations yeah. for the way magic works. Brandon Sanderson, all yeah. of his series, you know, they, they all have rules of how it works and explanations, even wheel of time channeling had some explanations yeah. and, Devices I mean, that could impact it, but you mean something more specific, or no? I was just saying, like the concept of like this science fantasy goes like way back, even to like <laughs> your John Carter of Mars, yeah, you know, yeah, Edgar yeah. Rice Burroughs stuff, you know, which wasn't really like there's not magic, but it's the whole concept of people leaving Earth, going to another planet, and yeah. then like swinging a sword, right? You know what I right. mean? Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. I'm into it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I do want to talk about uh, one institution. So the church uh, is an institution uh, that uh, believes in a, a single deity. Very, you know, it's not implicitly the Christian God, but it's modeled on a, a religion that, you know, most people would find familiar to what we have on earth these days. Yeah. And it's in has an intended purpose uh, of taming Erna and the Fae. Like if, if they can get enough people to join their faith and sincerely believe that there is, you know, one God uh, and that the laws of natural order work in this way, they are convinced and they may be right that, you know, they can make Erna basically like Earth. Like they can change the way that everything works by using Erna's own rules, which I thought was a pretty neat. But there's uh, yeah, but yeah. there's lots of other people who just worship whatever. And you know, there are there lots are of multitudes gods. of gods, and they are like there because <laughs> yeah. people believe that they're there. And Absolutely, they you can talk there. to a god if you yeah. believe in him, yeah. sure, and you they, can ask him to do something for you, and he'll probably be able to. Yeah, do it. it's some. It's sort. It's like I mean, and this was later, but Genius. like Neil Gaiman's American yeah. Gods, like they yeah. have their power because people believe in. They yeah. have their existence because people believe them. It's very much like that. It's actually a lot like Piers Anthony's novel Tarot had oh, like I don't think I read that one. It was another like they're on another planet, but on that planet, like what you believe in becomes reality. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Um, There's a Star is, Trek the original series episode like that too. Yeah. So it's <laughs> but she does some interesting things with that concept. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to talk about the characters? Yeah, so I mean right. I guess there are three main characters yeah. right our main man damien vrice damien kilcannon vrice <laughs> you know, we don't have to do all of his titles but yeah damien he's got a lot of titles he sure does he's a warrior priest he's a pop uh, star 
He is. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a famous dude. Uh, he is a true believer. He's not a pop and, star. I mean, okay. That's fair. He's not a pop star. But anyway, uh, he is a true believer and warrior priest of uh, the Church of Human Reunification. Yeah. Um, but he is something of an outcast. But yeah. So I he, thought you were going to say he's like kind of cool. He is. Like, like because that. he's. Yeah. He is not your standard, like, paladin from right. D&D yeah. that's, like, straight... Like, he is willing to... Well, first of all, he's a sorcerer. So yes. he he... Which is very against the church. Yeah, yeah. So he... But it's a new sort of, like, a new mm-hmm. idea within the church that they're going to try and, you know... Hey, just believing hasn't been working, and yeah. we might need somebody that can actually go and fight these demons and convince people that the church has benefit. Yeah. And so, to a certain extent, he is like he is a man of faith, and yep. he is very like you know driven by his integrity and his honor and stuff. Yep. But he's also willing to lay, you know, have a good time. I guess. You yeah, know I mean? like, yeah. When he gets into town, he he's looking around for something fun to do. Yeah. He, he, Finds a lady who catches his fancy and decides that he's going to, you know, shoot his shot. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting way. So I guess we'll talk about Siani now. Oh, um, I know. Right. Yeah, because we're talking about this. See? But yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting way to start like an epic fantasy trilogy. It's just these two people. He meet, Damien meets Siani, who is a, an adept, yep. who is someone who... Not so. There's a difference, I guess, between sorcerers and adepts. Yeah. Adepts are just like born being able to see and interact and do stuff with the fae. They're where, very much one with the. Where fae. sorcerers have to like work on it and yeah. like use like spell casting rituals working. and yeah. words and stuff. Where a an adept can just kind of like do it yep. naturally. Um, but they meet each other and they start a courtship. And so like the first. It's like a gunslinger rolling into town and yeah. hitting the local general store, and there's a, a pretty pretty lady working yeah. behind the counter, and she, she makes a big impression. She's a cool character, you can tell from the start. She's a shopkeeper. Uh, she uh, is More than that. brilliant. She's like the center of town. Uh, the patriarch uh, of Jagannath, actually, uh, speaking of her, talks about how all of the guilds in the city respect her. Yeah. And She's very powerful. Yeah, and influential, and for good reasons. Yeah, she is. Uh, and they start a courtship, and that's like the first couple chapters yeah. of the book is like the courtship between these two characters. Yeah. And then, like, tragedy strikes, but we won't. Yeah, no we're not going to talk too much about that. But Something happens it, that sets people on a yeah. quest. So that's how it starts, and yeah. it's an interesting way to start, like, a, a fantasy novel. Yeah. Last know? thing I want to say about Damien's job, why he's in uh, this town to start off with, uh, again, it's to train sorcerers. Uh, yeah. To work for the church uh, and to fight for the church, uh, and that is a very controversial uh, mission because it's exactly what uh, the Neo Count of Marintha uh, wanted to do. The original prophet of the Church of Human Reunification, who ended up becoming uh, that church's antichrist. Uh, he's the worst uh, person in that church's opinion. Uh, He's going to burn in hell forever, as far as they're concerned. And then the next main the, character is the, Gerald Tarrant. Tarrant. I'm so glad you didn't say Tarrant, man. <laughs> yeah, Gerald Tarrant. Uh, he was on the <laughs> cover. Um, that is our guy. Um, Michael Whalen's. Michael Whalen's cover. Cool drawing yeah. of Gerald. Gerald Tarrant is the selling point of this. I mean, everything he, he that we've is, talked about. He's an adept. Right. He is an adept. Uh, <laughs> what else can we say about him without spoiling anything? I want to say that he is, uh, like many uh, characters that we uh, talk about on this uh, show, uh, an extremely sympathetic anti-hero. Um, or is he an anti-hero? <laughs> um, yeah, we can't really... Get, he, he's a, extremely powerful. He's extremely charismatic. He's extremely smart. Uh, he reminds me a, a bit of Elric and Melnybone. 100%. Yeah, yeah, and actually I was going to... I'm glad that you... So I was going to mention Michael Moorcock, actually, <laughs> when we were talking about, you know, the history of science fantasy, you mm-hmm. know? Um, I wouldn't say the Elric novels necessarily are science fantasy, but the other stuff that Michael Moorcock wrote around those novels definitely were 
yeah. science fantasy, you mm-hmm. know, like the whole the eternal the champion, eternal champion, yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, he's very much, I would say, an, an Elric type character. If, um, if, and that's a good thing. Yeah, you know? it's a super good thing. I mean, we you, like know, you know you've named a character in some RPG you were playing Elric. I know yeah, you if have. If you're watching this, you have. Yeah, if you, yeah. if you say you haven't, you're a liar. Don't lie. <laughs> People want to understand the true <laughs> you. Just show us who you are. It's Let okay. Yeah. We all were Elric at some point. You know? Absolutely. We're all Elric at yeah. some point. <laughs> Crash and burn. Crash and burn. Uh, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about the world, uh, and then we're going to set you free to uh, start your adventure. Uh, we mentioned that the uh, the opening uh, takes place in the city of Jagannath, uh, which is the headquarters of the eastern uh, portion of the Human Reunification Church. It's a big city. Uh, it's Jerusalem. Yeah, like, it I is believe Jerusalem. it is a, supposed to be a I, yes. recreation of Jerusalem. Yep. Yeah. Uh, many religions coexisting. Uh, in the same place uh they advocate the worship of personal gods and the church of one god share the the city uh but yeah jagannath uh it's where things start uh it's jerusalem yeah i think that's basically enough to say yeah it is like i mean not just that it's metaphorically i think like the idea when they landed there was like they were yeah they were going to rebuild jerusalem on erna you know which is a cool idea it is neat and then, so I guess we're going to talk about the rock lens. So yeah. this is the rock are, I mean, Zach was talking a little bit about the, the most evolved species on the planet yeah. and really the only, well, they're not the only, but the most intelligent species on the planet. They're outside. kitty cat people. Yeah, they are kitty cat people, but yeah. that's sort of spoilerish. I mean, a little. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, not really. Uh, but yeah. But, I guess they talk about the rock yeah, pretty early really and early. their um, evolution. Yeah. Right? So they were not, you know, started off. They were like not tigers. intelligent at the beginning, but we landed and like our thoughts made these creatures evolve into. Yeah. And they, they have a very, and rightfully so, have a very uh, protective uh, and. They don't like humans. I'm very much. yeah. Would say. How yes. would you feel if you <laughs> yeah. were if you are you and you found out that hey, you only have these thoughts, feelings, emotions, and higher levels of uh, you know uh, cognition because the trees believe you do. I mean, that well, becomes... and that they're not supposed to be there. Yeah. they're just they just <laughs> land on, just on this planet. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be a cat. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Uh, but they're uh, some of yeah. them might be thankful. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, the Rocklands is a, 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 a populated by the rock. It's a desert, uh, pretty interesting area that a lot of the book takes place in. And I think the last place that we want to talk about uh, during this review is the forest. Uh, it's like your traditional haunted forest, yeah, right? Yeah, and it's great. It, it's yeah. I mean, we could probably leave it there. It, it's the haunted forest. It's uh, where it's like Castlevania, but yeah. you know, it's, it, if you were going through a forest in Castlevania, it's that you know. That might be the most accurate yeah. description yeah. I could even. <laughs> I could net, that. That's brilliant, actually. It is. Um, I mean, that's a little bit of detail. The Fae. Uh, yeah. There's a whirlpool of Fae that. Uh, kind of circles around and uh ends up in the forest and it, it's not just any fae but uh particularly malicious fae uh or dark fae if, if you are a bad person and you have ill intent and you get close enough to the forest you will naturally find yourself turning towards the forest if you have an option of you know which direction am i going to go you're just going to naturally start going to the forest and once you find yourself in there you're unlikely to find your way back out. yeah and like sorcerers and stuff can't access the fae there because if they open yeah. themselves up to it it would like drive them crazy or just kill them because it's like so powerful it yeah. would like burn them out boom yeah yeah instantly so uh i it's guess a really it's an interesting idea and a central like yeah. part of the story yeah here's like a an incredibly dangerous place in a place but that you have to go to and your best weapons aren't going to work at all and you can't even access yeah. it like um that's why i mean but damien kilcain and rice is pretty cool with a sword right and a gun and celia does a good job i think of putting these characters that are all i mean 
all of the characters are super powerful. Oh, like yeah. those three characters, uh, <laughs> Damien, Gerald, and Siani, yeah. are all very, very powerful. But like she does globally a, powerful. She does a good job of being able to put them in situations where their powers are useless yeah. or they're unaccessible. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they have to figure Even out. Even as to do powerful things. as they are, they still find themselves in true peril. Yeah. Like in believable 100%. peril. Yeah. Um, and. Well, I can't really say that, but survival's not guaranteed for any of these We people. might seem like we're dancing around some things here. We sure are. we <laughs> don't want to spoil stuff, but there's some other really cool ideas. Like, there's there's drug use oh, yeah. in this book, and the way that Celia Friedman writes about it mm -hmm. is... <clears throat> I don't know. I find it pretty... The questionable morality, like the, the, but that's the subjective the morality. I feel like she writes about it without being judging. Well, right. No, you know? th like, and that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. Like, she writes about it without judgment, and uh, a lot of this book is all about perspective, and it makes space for per all kinds of perspectives. Good, evil, drugs are good, drugs are bad. Yeah, you know? and so you want to... I mean, we talk about the hero. Yeah, of the let's book. talk about the hero. I mean, you really so you have Damien and you have Gerald, and yeah. they both. I mean, so I just want to. This isn't spoiling too much, but when they first, one of their first interactions with one another involves like essentially a kid who was OD'd. Yep. You know, and he's like. He's gone. Yeah. Like, essentially, he has no... He's taken these kind of drugs that uh, open him up to the Fae in mm -hmm. a way that he's never going to, like... He's essentially a vegetable. Yeah. You know? His, his self has left his body. Yeah. yeah. And I guess... And it's Damien and Gerald's argument and kind of approach. And eventually... So, Damien basically lets Gerald... This is very early in the book. Let's <laughs> Gerald kill this kid. He does. And, like, just lets him. Mm -hmm. um, he regrets it later. But it's, you know, it's all about their two approaches yeah. to what morality is. And then Gerald would say that he was doing the right thing. Right. You know? Yeah. And maybe he was. And like I you. think that Damien would say that he had to make a choice between the lesser of two evils, right? Right. Uh, and that's sort of what this whole series is about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Damien uh, is the, you know, most of the book is from his point of view. Yeah. Uh, main character. Uh, and, you know, could be argued as the hero. And from his point of view, he is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah. But like, <laughs> but like Gerald would argue, if you let this kid live as a vegetable, he's just a drain on yep. the mother who doesn't have the money to keep him, yep. and he's never. Gerald, you know, is certain that he's never. There is no recovery, and I think Damien's uncertain about if there was a chance for recovery, and I think that's a really good way to position these two characters. Yeah. That's when they first meet. It's like very It's the first time they go through this exercise. <laughs> yeah. And they do this exercise many, many times. Oh you yeah. Know? Uh yeah, I don't even uh, we'll probably end up cutting this out, but essentially Gerald <laughs> has to you know, there is a, a an antagonist. And Gerald is forced uh to either not have a chance of defeating this antagonist or to work with uh someone that he thinks is basically evil. Uh, well, not just basically that he's one hundred percent convinced is evil and a bad person. Wait, you're saying Damien? Yeah. Oh, I said Gerald, didn't I? You yeah, did. yeah. So Damien has to work with somebody that he thinks is completely evil and a bad person. Uh, Gerald actually thinks that Damien's kind of like a cute little puppy in a lot of ways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Reminds him they, of himself. They don't like each other a whole lot, and that's <laughs> sort of like the driving force of the whole series. But I will have to say, uh, Black Sun Rising is very much a standalone adventure story. Oh, yeah. You don't I have mean, to read it, all three books. It sets kind of up, like, the further adventures of, you know, yeah. some of the characters, but, like, it is 100% a standalone piece of work. 100%, you know? yeah. And it's not, you know, as far as these books go, it's not outrageous. Oh, no, it's only, like, it's less 500 than five, pages. less than 500 pages, I think. So. Less yeah. than 500, Neil's big version, 500 in my uh, paperback. Really? Yep. Uh, but yeah, tremendous book. Uh, it's been around for a while. It doesn't seem to get the attention that you might think, but uh, four eighty nine. Four eighty nine. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I've read the, this book probably three or four times. I hope that you will uh, pick it up and give it a shot. 
Uh, yeah, her writing is really, uh, it's, she's a really good writer. I have to say, I haven't read this book in like 20 some years and I going back and rereading it has raised my estimation of it. Yeah. Uh, she's a, an excellent writer and she has, she's written a lot of other stuff and has recently done like prequel stuff for the cold fire trilogy, but yeah. just start with that one book. I mean, it's really excellent. Yeah, so. I didn't know there was a prequel, but yeah, you're, Neil's right. Black Sun Rising is where you should start, uh, and I think that's where we'll leave it. All right, thanks for watching Tweet Up. Peace out. Peace. Captain Depression, we salute you. Cause I'm only a private, but you know my heart is in it. Yeah, I swear my heart is in it. I never asked you. Exactly what I got I never